I'm now to introduce Dr. David Suzuki, and I'm going to do that really quickly because I think you'd like to hear him. Uh, David is a scientist, broadcaster, author, co-founder of the David Suzuki Foundation. He's a professor emeritus at the University of British Columbia, holds 28 honorary degrees from universities around the world, and has been recognised by the UN for his environmental leadership. And tonight, I'm really intrigued at uh, what you will talk to us about, which is imagining a sustainable future. Foresight, which I hope is part of the domain of a university, rather than hindsight, which is when it's often too late. If you'd please join me in welcoming Dr. David Suzuki. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that warm welcome on a Saturday night, taking time out. I really appreciate uh, your, your doing that. And thank you, Linda, for that welcome. I would like to simply acknowledge that I am on the tra traditional territory of the First Nations people, as I do whenever I'm in Canada as well. I, um, I'm deeply honored to join such an eminent list of speakers in the Jack Beal lecture series, and thank you, David, for coming and uh, honoring me with your presence. And thank you to the university for the privilege of being able to share a few of my ideas with you. Now, I have to admit, I was shocked when I arrived here. Uh, I mean, so soon after an election and things seemed to be happening, uh, that I wrote a whole bunch of additional stuff you uh, say I have 40 minutes I, and 10 minutes to, I'm going to use a lot of that for my additional stuff. I was thinking, should I have changed that to the barbarians have breached the gates? Um, but let me go back to uh, what I've written down. If you were to say, I want, to I want to figure out what do Australians think? Are there really important issues that confront them as, as a people? And I'm going to judge that by the amount of time or space in newspapers and news reports on TV and radio. Okay, and I think you'd very quickly find Australians, the absolutely highest priority is sports. That uh, coming after that, of course, is business through all of the ads that are in uh, the media, and then politics and, of course, celebrity and entertainment. And, of course, what that, does, what, uh, what that does is to distract you from the fact that the most powerful factor shaping our lives, our society, our world today is none of those things. It's science. Science when applied by industry, medicine, and the military. I was born in 1936. When I was a child, my parents never worried that I was watching too much television, playing too much video games, or text messaging too much, because none of those existed when I was a child. When I was a child, my parents wouldn't let me go to movies or public swimming pools in the summer because they were afraid I would catch polio. Polio, most children today have no idea what polio is. It's almost extinct around the world. Back then, smallpox ravaged the world every year. Millions of people caught smallpox, and hundreds of thousands of people died every year. It's been extinct for over 30 years. Today's children don't know anything of diphtheria, scarlet fever, measles, chicken pox, pox or mumps that uh, we were all afraid of when I was a kid. There were no commercial jets, satellites, Xerox, organ transplants, antibiotics, plastics, nuclear plants, oral contraceptives, cloning or genetic engineering, and I could make you a list that would go on for pages of what wasn't when I was a child. And you realize that each of these innovations transforms the way that we live, rendering the old ways that we did things extinct and uh, changing the very definition of our society and our values and what it is to be a human being. I spent eight years from 1954 to 1962 getting an education at top universities in the United States, the kind of education that wasn't possible in Canada at that time. And this period spanned the most exciting period 
of, uh, for science students uh, in, in history. In 1957, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik. And it was a shock, it was electrifying, but the Americans began to scramble to try to catch up. And it was a glorious time to be, all you had to do was say, I like science, and they threw money at you. I mean, here I was a foreigner studying there, and it was great. And uh, job offers came to me long before I graduated, and I didn't even apply for them. I got a job offer from Stanford. I was amazed. But I left the United States after a year of postdoctoral studies because I wanted to go home to Canada. Canada was different, and for me, it was preferable. I didn't think we're better than Americans. I just didn't, I didn't want to live in, in the United States when I had a country of Canada. To me, Canada meant, first and foremost, a man named Tommy Douglas, who was the head of the CCF, the Socialist Party that brought Medicare to Canada. Canada meant Quebec and the French language, the National Film Board and the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, Canada meant equalization payments from the richest provinces that were given each year to the poorest provinces to help them out. Canada meant social security. Canada to me meant sharing, caring, and cooperating. Not the dog-eat-dog -dog survival of the fittest that was the American style of society. But when I arrived home, I was a hotshot geneticist and I was going to set the world on fire. I was shocked to discover the extent of scientific illiteracy in my country. And the reflection of that scientific illiteracy was the degree to which science was supported by government. It was virtually, uh, we were given handouts. My first year as a university professor, I got a grant for $4,200. They told me you should have got $3,500, but you had a year of postdoctoral study, so we're giving you a bigger grant. At the same time, my colleagues that I had graduated with in the United States were getting grants between sixty dollars and $80,000. So I began to wonder whether I should think if I wanted to make a reputation in science to go back to the United States, when lo and behold, I was given a huge grant from the Americans that, uh, that I could use in Canada. So thanks to the Americans and their funding, I was able to stay in my own country. But in 1962, as I was beginning my career, something very significant happened. I was asked by a local community channel to give a lecture on television, to give a lecture on genetics. So I did it as a lark. They paid me 15 bucks. And they liked it so much that I ended up doing eight. And that was my first television series. Because as I became involved, I realized this is a powerful a powerful teaching tool. The program was called Your University Speaks. <laughs> Nothing could be more boring than that. <laughs> but it was shown on Sunday morning at 8. <laughs> and I was shocked because after a couple of these shows had run, I walked on campus and a number of people said, hey, I saw your show, I really liked that show. And I'm going, what the hell are you doing watching television at 8 o'clock on Sunday morning? That's when I realized, holy cow, people really do watch television. Uh, and it can be a powerful way of informing people. You see, I, I believed, and I still believe, that we make the best decisions when we have the best information available to make the assessment before arriving at a decision. And I felt that science was too important to leave just to politicians and business people to decide on that the public had to have an input in how science was going to affect their lives. And the best way was to popularize science and make it available to the general public. I have to admit it's been absolutely astonishing to watch the revolution in communication technology, to see what's available now. When I started in television in 1962, there were only two channels in Canada. One of them was our, our own CBC, but in, uh, then a private channel. That was it. But to see today, there are 24-hour news channels that they're on with uh, satellite or cable. In Canada, we now get between 400 and 1,000 channels are, are accessible. And with laptops, PCs, and tablets, 
mobile phones, we can now tap in to information from around the world. It's truly astonishing. The problem, of course, is most of what's available is gibberish. It's babble. It's about sex. It's about selling stuff and ads. And it's polluted from the kind of information we're getting from big pharma, from oil companies, from the chemical industry, and so on. But as I was back in the 1960s swept up in the environmental movement, television, in fact, was a powerful force and influence. And I was very proud of the fact that I had done a number of shows that added in a small way to a number of uh, the, the discussions about issues and a number of victories. I got involved in doing programs that uh, uh, opposed the proposal by the Americans to move super tankers from the North Slope in Alaska down the British Columbia coast to Seattle to be refined in Seattle. We fought that and we stopped it. We, uh, there was a proposal to drill for oil in one of the most uh, uh, dangerous areas of the BC coast in Hecate Strait and we stopped it. A dam was to be built on the Peace River at Site C. We stopped that. Americans want, keep wanting to drill in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in Alaska. This is the calving grounds of the largest uh, group of mammals on the planet, the, uh, the porcupine caribou herd. Each time the Americans were trying to push through a legislation to allow drilling, uh, I did a show on the caribou, and I'm not saying we stopped it, but it helped each time. Uh, we stopped the initiative. And uh, I was very involved in raising money and, and uh, doing programs about the proposal that Brazil had to build a dam at Altamira, the Cararao Dam, that had been offered $500 million from the World Bank, and we got the bank to pull its uh, loan. Each of these battles ended in a huge victory in the 1980s. And each of these battles that I've mentioned is, guess what, back on the agenda. And here is where I think that despite the enormous success of the environmental movement in the 60s and 70s, we have fundamentally failed to use each of the battles to broaden out the public understanding of why we were doing these battles. Why were we opposing the dam? It wasn't just power of enviros against the developers, enviros against the oil industry. It was because we had a different way of looking at the world. That environmentalism is a way of seeing our place within the biosphere. And that's what the battles were fought over, but that's not what, why then the battles are recurring. We have failed to shift the perspective, or in the popular uh, jargon, we failed to move or shift the paradigm. We're still stuck in the old way of seeing things. So I uh, come to the barbarians then, and that is many of the politicians and corporate executives that uh, environmentalists have been fighting all these years. They are driven, really, for, uh, by a, a totally different set of values. They're driven by uh, the drive for profit, for growth, and for power. And in that drive, they fail to see the bigger picture that environmentalism uh, informs us about. Look at the largest corporations like Apple and Walmart and Shell and Exxon and Monsanto. They're bigger and richer now than most governments. And we treat them as if they're people. They're corporations, they're not people. Why do we allow them to fund Politicians, for God's sakes, they're not people. Politicians are running to look out for our future. But because corporations have the wealth to fund to a massive amount, after an election, guess who gets in the door to talk to the ministers and the elected representatives? It's corporations. And what we find is that governments now are being driven by a corporate agenda, which is not about our well-being and our happiness and our future. Look at the, uh, the climate skeptics today. You know, you, you think of all of the PR and ads and entire programs run on television today that are funded by corporations. 
When you uh, look at the climate skeptics, most of them are hired guns for the fossil fuel industry. Many of them were the same people that were saying tobacco wasn't dangerous if you smoked it uh, 30 years ago. Don't, don't believe me. Read a book like uh, Merchants of Doubt by Naomi Oreskes, or read the book by, uh, called Climate Cover-Up by James Hogan, or go to Desmog Blog, a site set up just to follow where these skeptics, where do they get their money? Follow the money and then ask, how credible are they? The, uh, the uh, politicians today have very few tools with which to shape behavior in society. One of the tools they do have is regulation. You pass laws, set targets, and, and you pass laws mandating them. And of course, they are hated and fought tooth and nail by corporations, largely successfully. Another tool they have, an enormous tool, is taxation. Taxation can be used to tax the things that we don't want and pull the taxes off the things that we do want to encourage. Uh, and tax, we know that taxes work as a way of changing human behavior. The carbon tax, putting a price on carbon, is by far the most effective way to begin to, to get corporations, to get companies, to get people to reduce their carbon footprint. There's just no question about that. Your, your prime minister, your new prime minister, ran on the promise to eliminate the carbon tax. I have no doubt that he's going to do that and will probably make this politically toxic now for at least a decade before it will be able to come back on the agenda. And this, of course, is just what corporations have wanted. But it works. In Canada, we have the same kinds of arguments. And we argue, oh, well, we're a northern country. We've got to burn more fossil fuels. If we try to begin to reduce our carbon footprint, it'll destroy the economy. But we don't look at what's happening in a country very much like Canada, Sweden, a northern country which imposed a carbon tax in 1992. They now pay $140 a ton to put carbon in the atmosphere. They have reduced their carbon emissions by 8 percent below 1990 levels, which is beyond the Kyoto target. And during that interval, their economy grew by more than 40 percent. So all of this argument that we can't afford to put a, carbon, a price on carbon, it will destroy the economy, is just what uh, the corporations uh, want, believed, and said. There, there is in Canada a legal category where people can be sued and thrown in the slammer called willful blindness. If people in positions of power deliberately suppress or ignore information that is vital to the decisions they're making. That is willful blindness. I call it more than willful blindness. I call it criminal negligence because it's a crime against future generations to avoid facing the reality of what's going on. And that and that is what Mr. Abbott is doing by canceling the commission, by firing Tim Flannery. It is criminal negligence by, through willful blindness. In my country, we have a government, I'm ashamed to say, that is even more intensely on this path because they've been in power longer than Mr. Abbott. Uh, Stephen Harper, our prime minister, was a big admirer of John Har Howard and of uh, George Bush. And uh, he has canceled virtually all research going on in Canada on climate change. He has muzzled government scientists. They are not allowed to speak out in public, e even in areas in which they are expert, unless they are first vetted by the prime minister's office. Scientific papers must go through the PMO, the prime minister's office, before they are allowed to be submitted for publication. So we're now getting science being molded to fit a political ideological agenda. He is laying off scientists in, in sectors like climate re or atmosphere research, forestry, fisheries. So we can go into a very uncertain future basically blind. 
In the book 1984, George Orwell speaks of Newspeak, that when you can convince people that black is white and that war is peace, you can tell them anything. And what better way to convince, uh, to allow people to believe whatever you say by shutting down all avenues of serious, hard information? How can we make truly informed decisions if the scientific community itself is shut down? And I say to you that in your society, scientists better be up at the ramparts making sure you don't follow the path that Canada is on right now. Because then, when politicians are relieved of having to pay attention to real information, to science, they can base their decisions on what? The Quran? The Bible? My big toe has a bunion? I mean, what the hell is going on? So, uh, as a Canadian, I, I beg Australians to think hard about what's happened in Canada and please avoid that to, in your country. How on earth have we reached this point in human history? One of the most amazing things to me as a geneticist is the way that scientists can now manipulate and use DNA, the genetic material. And one thing that scientists can do is to use DNA to follow the movement of humankind across the planet back through time. And all trails lead back to Africa 150,000 years ago. And as Linda said, I, I never actually spoke to the Ku Klux Klan. I'm waiting for them to invite me. <laughs> but if I did, I would tell them that we're all Africans, for God's sake. What's your, what's your problem? <laughs> Scientists, and if you look back, if you try to imagine when we were born as a species, Imagine that we could be transported back in time and, and hover above the Serengeti Plains 150,000 years ago. The plains would be covered with animals in abundance and variety beyond anything we could imagine today. And you'd have to look very hard to spot little clusters of three, four, or five of these funny-looking two-legged furless apes. And that was us. Now, I am sure no other species back then would went, said to their kids, Go, don't, don't alarm that, God, that naked ape. They're, they're going to take over the planet. I mean, <laughs> what the hell did we have going for us? Uh, you know, we, we weren't very big. There weren't many of us. We weren't fast. We weren't strong. Uh, nobody would be worried about this animal that in 150 millennia would take over the planet. What was our secret? Well, of course, you couldn't see our secret. It was a two kilogram organ buried deep in our skulls. The human brain was the secret of our success. Francois Jacob, a Nobel Prize winner, said that the human brain has a, an inbuilt need for order. We don't like things happening that we don't understand. So we have a genetic impulse to try to organize what we see around us into some kind of way that makes sense. We create worldviews by trying to fit everything uh, together. The human mind conferred a tremendous memory capacity. No other mammal on earth has the memory capacity of a human brain. We were inventive and we were curious. We, we were able to dream of, of things and, and one thing we dreamt of was a future. No other animal has a concept of a future as we do. I mean, the future doesn't exist. The only thing that's real is now and what we remember from the past. But because we invented the notion of a future, we are the only animal that realized we can affect the future by what we do today. Based on our knowledge and experience, we can look ahead. We can see where the dangers are and see where the, the opportunities lie and we could deliberately choose a path to avoid the dangers and exploit the opportunities. I believe foresight was that great gift that the human mind conferred upon us. That we were able to plot our way into the future. And today we've come to dominate the planet where we've occupied every continent. We are the, the numerous mammal on the planet. And we have amplified abilities to analyze and look ahead. We call them scientists. We have supercomputers. And scientists now act in the best tradition of our species. They look at the information available and they try to look ahead to see where the dangers and opportunities lie. And I'd like to just give you an example of one of those uh, attempts by scientists. This is a remarkable document 
called World Scientists Warning to Humanity. It was published in November of 1992. And it was signed by more than 1,700 scientists from uh, 71 countries in the world and included over half of all Nobel Prize winners who were alive at that time. So that's a pretty big, uh, pretty good roster. I mean, these are top scientists, not fly-by-night scientists. What are, they, what are they saying in the world's scientist warning? Human beings and the natural world are on a collision course. Human activities inflict harsh and often irreversible damage on the environment and on critical resources. If not checked, many of our current pra practices put at serious risk the future we wish for human society and may so alter the living world that it will be unable to sustain life in the manner that we know. Fundamental changes are urgent if we are to avoid the collision our present course will bring about. 1992. They go on then and list the areas of the collision is occurring in. The, o the atmosphere, water resources, oceans, soil, forests, species extinction and population. And then the words grow even more bleak. No more than one or a few decades remain before the chance to avert the threats we now confront will be lost and the prospects for humanity immeasurably diminished. A great change in our stewardship of the earth and life on it is required if vast human misery is to be avoided and our global home on this planet is not to be irretrievably mutilated. And then they go on and list what they believe we must do immediately. A frightening document. A terrifying document. Scientists of this stature don't normally sign petitions or, or comments like this. But if this document is frightening, the response of the media around the world was terrifying. There was none. What, human, what these scientists were telling us is that human beings have become so powerful we are now altering the chemical, the physical, and the biological properties of the planet on a geological scale. Physically, we create dams, divert rivers, and build huge lakes. We uh, drain entire wetlands, remove mountaintops to get at coal, have build massive open pit mines, and because of our fracking practices now, we know that we are inducing earthquakes. Chemically, you know, we've passed 400 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Because of the carbon in the atmosphere, it dissolves in the oceans, creating carbonic acid and is acidifying the oceans. Nitrogen fertilizers spread on land are washing into the seas and creating areas of eutrophication that become dead zones because all of the oxygen is depleted. The, uh, we Pollutants, of course, are spread throughout the air, water, and soil. Every one of you, I'm sorry, however well you're living, every one of us in this room is carrying dozens of toxic chemicals in our bodies. And with endocrine disruptors from plastics, the whole process of development and differentiation of our reproductive capacity has been uh, interfered with. Biologically, we are driving entire ecosystems out of existence for farming, cattle, ranches, roads, housing. And we are introducing alien species all over the planet. Australia knows about alien species and spades. And driving some 50,000 species to extinction every year. That's why scientists call this moment in time the Anthropocene Epoch the era when humans have become a geological force. And it has happened very, very suddenly. That's what gives the urgency now to addressing the issue. You see, for all of 150,000 years, there were never a billion human beings. We reached a population of a billion people. Well, if you go back at the beginning of the agricultural revolution, that, which is 10,000 years ago, we think there were about 20 uh, 20 million human beings in the world. When Jesus Christ was born, there were some 200 million. We reached a billion, the first mammalian species to reach a billion uh, any time on Earth, 
about 1803. When I was born, there were just over 2 billion people on the planet. Can you imagine in my lifetime, population is more than tripled. If you were to plot that on a graph, and I think every student ought to do that, just plot on a, on a, a graph in which the x-axis is 150,000 years and the y-axis is uh, population of humans in, in billions. And um, what you find is the curve is virtually flat for 99% and in the last pencil width of time, it explodes straight up off the page. Every human being today has to be fed, clothed, and sheltered. And just to stay alive then, it, we have a very big ecological footprint. It takes a lot of air, water, and land to keep us alive. But of course, we're not like a rabbit or a rat or a mouse. We have an enormous amount of technology used on our behalf. And uh, you know, I look out at an audience like this and I see lots of uh, cotton shirts and, and wool suits and I'm sure well, for this is the first time I've ever had an audience where I might not be able to say this. I always say to an audience, I'm sure no one in this room has a field of cotton plants growing in your backyard or a flock of sheep, but some of you might have a flock of sheep. But the vast majority of us would have no such thing. But thanks to technology, technology that now can exploit to the far reaches of every corner on the planet for raw materials and deliver the goods that we take for granted in our lives, our computers, our cars, our food, all of that amplifies our impact, our ecological footprint. And it doesn't end there. Ever since World War II, we've been afflicted with an incredible appetite for stuff. We love to go shopping. 95% of American teenage girls call shopping their number one recreation. So they're having fun and getting their exercise at the same time. We love to buy stuff and all of the stuff that we buy comes out of Mother Earth and when we're finished with it, we throw it back into Mother Earth and that increases enormously our ecological footprint. And this is all overlain then by a globalized economy. I believe that globalization has, will be, if humans are around at the end of this century, globalization will be looked upon as one of the big disasters to, uh, to hit uh, our species. Globalization exploits the entire planet, the biosphere, for raw materials and as a dumping ground for our waste and toxic materials. But globalization does something as well. It hides, it hides the ecological and social impact of the stuff that we buy. In Canada, we, uh, we're a northern country. You know, it snows a lot in our country. And yet Canadians take for granted that, oh yeah, in the middle of winter, we can go down and buy fresh raspberries and strawberries and onions and tomatoes. Well, where the hell do they think that's growing in Canada? When I was a kid, when you wanted a vegetable or fruit in winter, my mom said, go to the, the canned goods section. But now we want fresh fruit. Do we not think that that's come from somewhere else on the planet? And what was the ecological cost of delivering that? You know, it only costs 10 cents per apple that we eat in the middle of winter that's shipped all the way from New Zealand. I don't know how the heck we can afford uh, uh, to, to get, I mean, 10 cents, that's all? The ecological cost uh, must be enormous. We, um, we uh, uh, I, I keep going to Japan and telling the Japanese, the oceans are a mess. Why aren't Japanese leading the world in, in fighting to protect the oceans? And they look at me with, with a blank stare saying, what are you talking about? Go down to Tsukiji, the world's largest fish market. There's lots of fish there. Well, the, the reality is 50 years ago, virtually all of the fish in Tsukiji would have been caught within 50 miles of Japan. Today, they're caught from around the world. But no, to them, it's just fish. I mean, lots of fish there, so everything is fine. Globalization hides the impact. When you go to buy a shirt, a cotton shirt, how many of you ever say, is this organic? Cotton is one of the most chemically intensive crops that we grow. And if you look at the big cotton growing area in Eurasia around the Aral Sea, it's been an absolute ecological and social disaster. But we don't ask that. I just want a t-shirt. I pay my money and I buy it without a second thought. And it's that way for virtually all of the products that we buy. But in this period of explosive growth 
in our ecological footprint, we are in fact undermining the very life support systems of the planet. You see, because we no longer see what the life support system is. You see, we live in a world that is shaped and constrained by laws of nature. In physics, we know that you can't build a rocket that will travel faster than the speed of light. Nobody complains about that, except maybe science fiction writers. We know that you're not going to get any faster than that. We know that the law of gravity says you can't build an anti-gravity machine here on, on Earth. And we know that the first and second laws of therm thermodynamics mean you cannot build a perpetual motion machine. We know that, and we accept that. Physics imposes that on the way that we live. In chemistry, it's the same thing. The, proper, the atomic property of atoms, the, uh, we know that there are diffusion rates and reaction constants. We know that there are limits on the kind of reactions we can carry out and molecules we can synthesize. And we live with that. That's imposed by the world that we live in. And in biology, it's the same thing. The biology dictates that as a species, we know that there are carrying capacities for any ecosystem. For us, we're not, we didn't evolve to fit a specific ecosystem. We're very adaptable. The entire biosphere has become our living quarters. And there has to be a carrying capacity for any species within that biosphere. It can't support an infinite number. But we also know that we are biological creatures. And uh, we're animals. And as animals, our biological makeup dictates absolute needs. I met with some uh, children two days ago here in Australia. And, and I said, now kids, I want you to try this for me. Take a deep breath. Now, OK, great. Now hold it. And you don't take another breath. Hold that breath for five minutes. I'm going to keep on talking. And you know, kids are so trusting, they try to do that, right? <laughs> and soon they're turning bright pink. And then, of course, they take a breath. And the illustration is air is something you need from the moment every one of us left our mother's body to the last breath we take before we die. We need air. Air is so important, you cannot commit suicide by deliberately holding your breath. Your body will not allow you to do that. We need air. If you don't have air for three or four minutes, you're dead. If you have, have to breathe contaminated air, you're sick. So surely, biology dictates our highest priority as an animal should be the protection of clean air. And it... <laughs> now, I didn't... I didn't realize the extent to which calling someone an animal is a real insult until I gave a lecture in, in Austin, Texas many years ago. And it was an audience about this size, but there were a lot of children in the audience. At the end of it, I said, now kids, if you remember one thing from my lecture, remember we are animals. My God, did their parents get pissed off at me? <laughs> Do really, don't you dare call my daughter an animal. We're human beings. You know, I mean, they, uh, and you can see our attitude towards other species. If you call someone a pig, or a chicken, or a worm, or a snake, or an ape, these are, these are insults, because somehow we think they're not up to us. I uh, was in a, I walked into a store in Calgary, Alberta, and in the front uh, window, there was a big sign that said, no animals allowed. And I... Uh, <laughs> I went in, I told the proprietor, I said, you know, that sign, if you enforce that, you're not going to have any customers. <laughs> and the scary thing to me is, he thought I was nuts. He didn't know what I was talking about, <laughs> right? So we don't like to remember that we are animals. And if we don't, we don't understand what our absolutely most fundamental need uh, can be. There are, so physics, chemistry, biology dictates clearly the world that we live in, and the limits and constraints on that world. We need clean water. Without water for more than a few days, you're dead. Drinking contaminated water, you're sick. So clean water is an absolute need for us as animals. We, most of our, all of our food was once alive, and most of it was grown in the soil. We need clean food. Without food, we die in a few weeks. Uh, with, some of us might live even pretty long. 
but eventually we kick the can and uh, if you have to eat contaminated food, of course you're sick, so maybe that's, that's important. And our biology dictates that all of the energy in our body that we need to move and grow and reproduce, all of that energy is sunlight captured by photosynthesis, transformed into chemical energy, and then we get that by eating the plants or eating the animals that eat the plants, and we store it in us. So again, that is an absolute need for photosynthesis. And what delivers these fundamental needs that we have as animals is the web of living things around the planet that we call biodiversity. Biodiversity delivers what I call the four sacred elements, earth, air, fire, and water. And as Linda says, that's what I learned from my Aboriginal brothers and sisters in Canada. I have been a student of, of theirs now for over 30 years. They never lost that understanding that we are part of the earth, that the rest of life are our brothers and sisters, and that we are created out of the four sacred elements from Mother Earth. We, uh, these, uh, those are things that, that we live within, the reality of our lives. Other things, though, we create and think that they are just as important. We draw borders around property, around cities, around states and countries. And boy, do we take those borders really seriously. We go to war. We will kill and die protecting those borders. In Texas, in the United States, you're allowed to kill someone legally who comes onto your property that you don't want there. We, those borders are, but you know what? Fish and birds and air and trees don't give a shit about our borders. You know, we take them very seriously for us, but don't expect nature to pay any attention to the borders that we create. And then we do other things. We invent other ideas like capitalism like economies, like corporations and markets. And man, we really take those things seriously. And we reify them. We, create, we act as if they're real entities. I mean, just listen to the news reports every morning. Uh, market's not looking too healthy this morning. You know, I think of this, whatever it is, lying in bed, you know, with a cold pack on his head, you know. Uh, when Mitt Romney, Mitt Romney said when he was running against Obama, if Obama is re-elected, the market is not going to be happy. <laughs> you know, what the, what, we, we, re, we make them into entities. You know, a few hundred years ago, we really believed in dragons and demons and monsters. I mean, we really believed we would give them jewels and sacrifice virgins and do anything to, to make sure they're happy. We didn't want, right? But today, we know those are figments of our imagination. Nobody believes in dragons, demons, or monsters today. But what do we do? We replace them with another demon or another figment of our imagination called the market. You know, and we do the same damn thing, 2008. What did Mr. Obama do? He poured hundreds of billions of dollars into the banks, into the market in order to get it back up. They created the buddy problem. He just wanted them back up and running again. Those are not forces of nature. We invented them. And guess what? They're the only thing we have a hope of changing if they're not working. You can't do the same with nature. But the result of reifying these ideas, these human elements or creations, is that they dominate the negotiations that we now involve ourselves in when it comes to the, the biosphere. Look at the international conferences we held in Rio in 1992, the largest gathering of heads of state ever in human history. Nobody remembers that at Rio, people signed a climate, climate convention saying we will stabilize 1990 levels by the year 2000. Kyoto, 1997, we set a target of a reduction 5 to 6 percent below 1990 levels by the year 2010. Australia was the only industrialized country allowed a target above 1990 levels because Australians whinged and whinged and whinged <laughs> about, no, 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 we need coal, we're a special country, we're... Anyway, <laughs> disappointed. But then... Yeah, 
It just boggles my mind, you know. I come to Australia, and I love Australia. I think of it as my second country. And yet, uh, you've got something Canadians would die for called sunlight. <laughs> and you have the nerve to say that, no, we can't get off coal. What the hell is going on? I know that you've got the... I know that you've got the expertise, CSIRO, your universities have really outstanding people if you just make the commitment that this is our opportunity, our energy source of the future. My God, you think of the opportunity. But no, we're still uh, stuck. And we're stuck because of the world in which human created ideas of borders and economies uh, fence in the argument or the discussions. And look at what happened in Copenhagen. Copenhagen was, uh, was supposed to be uh, a renewal then of the Kyoto process, which, by the way, most countries that signed on met their targets. Canada, Canada did not, but pulled out a year before the, the uh, agreement uh, ended. But uh, at Co Copenhagen, 192 countries gathered to, to negotiate the atmosphere that doesn't belong to anybody through the perceptual lenses of 192 national borders and 192 national economic agendas. So what we end up doing then is not dealing with the atmosphere as it should be. We try to shoehorn nature into a human agenda. It's never going to work. Simply cannot work. So, uh, you know, what do we do? I, uh, for years in British Columbia, I've battled the forest industry over their clear-cut uh, uh, practices. And to ward off these big battles, the, uh, the British Columbia government set up a series of round tables. And what round tables were, were, were area, uh, round table where all of the stakeholders, I hate that word, but all of the people with a vested interest in the future of that forest, could come to the table, and you then negotiate. And they're doomed to fail, because what you do then is you're fighting for your stake. And ultimately what results is compromise, or some win and some lose. And I just don't think we're at a point where we can compromise, and we can't have losers anymore. I've been um, asked by Shell, the Vice President Shell, to meet with uh, other environmentalists and his uh, executives to talk about uh, future energy strategies. But again, it was all couched within the shell, within the perspective of how do we pay for this? What is the economic cost of doing the right thing? Same thing, Marcel Coutu, who's the CEO of a consortium of tar sands companies, called me, came to Canada, Vancouver, visited me and said, will you talk to me? I said, sure, I'm happy to talk to you. But I'll only talk to you if we can agree on certain basic things. I don't want to fight anymore, Marcel. There's no point fighting. Let's start from a point of agreement. So how about this? How about starting by saying we are all animals? And as animals, our most fundamental need before anything else is clean air, clean water, clean soil, clean energy, and biodiversity. But we're also social animals. And as social animals, we have fundamental needs. What are our most fundamental social needs? How long have I gone on? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, let me take two more minutes. Our most fundamental social needs, it turns out, to my amazement, is love. Now, I'm not a hippy-dippy whatever. <laughs> if you look at the literature, our most fundamental need for children is an environment of maximum love, when they can be hugged, kissed, and loved. Because that's what creates, that's what humanizes us and allows us to realize our full potential. And you, talk, you look at studies of children growing up under conditions of genocide, uh, racism, war, and terror. Children who are deprived of those opportunities. Or the orphans in Romania under Ceausescu. And you find people who are fundamentally crippled physically and psychically. They die like flies. So we need love to be fully human. And to ensure love, 
We need to have full employment. We need social justice. We need gender equity. We need freedom from hunger and poverty. These are, it seems to me, our most fundamental needs as social creatures. And then we're spiritual beings. And as spiritual animals, we have a need for spirit. I'm not talking about formal religion. But I believe we have to understand, as First Nations do around the world, that we emerged out of nature. And when we die, we return to nature. We need to know there are forces impinging on us that we will never understand or control. We need to have sacred places where we go with respect, not just looking for resources or opportunity. These are things that I could go on saying what, what spirit means. But I believe that we are doomed to fail unless we come together and agree on what our most basic needs are. And then we ask, how do we create an economy? How do we make a living? How do we keep viable, strong communities? We're doing it all the wrong way because we take ourselves so seriously. And we think that we're so smart, we create things that can dominate the discussions. That's the challenge of what has to change. Thank you. I think he's earned a glass of water. I hope it's clean. <laughs> Just to kick things off, David, so as you know, I'm Merlin Crossley, the Dean of Science here. So to start off the questions, earlier this year at UNSW, we had a sort of corporate guy here, a guy called Bill Gates. And, you know, he has been in charge of a corporation. He's been in the business world. He's had huge influence. Recently, he's devoted himself to good causes in global health. Business people are sort of very influential. At the end, you told us a couple of people who you haven't managed to sort of persuade. Are there people in the business world who can help to agree on things and use their influence so that it's not always a battle? Well, I think the problem is that the, I have some very good friends who started a very successful company in Canada called Roots. It's a clothing company. And they, they have come to many of my lectures and the the, uh, Michael B Budman, one of the uh, founders, said, you know, Dave, I agree with everything you say, but if I were to go to the bank and say, I, uh, Roots has captured 5% of the garment market in Canada. I am a multimillionaire, which he is. My employees are paid a very good wage. They're happy. We don't want to grow any further. We just want to stay at 5 or 6% of the market, but I'd like to get a loan to refurbish my plant. He said, if I don't submit a, a plan that says we're going to continue to grow, that's considered dying. That a stable, and so that's the creed of the cancer cell. How do you operate within that kind of an economic system? It's crazy. It's suicidal. So yes, there are all kinds of enlightened people. And Bill Gates, you know, everybody's oligog with Bill ba Gates. God damn it, he's a multi-billionaire. Nobody should be allowed to own it, be worth a billion dollars. I find that obscene. So, so you know, yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad he's spending it on those good things. But I, you know, I just, I, I find the whole idea that, that people of that wealth are the ones that we then turn to, to to do good things. That's why we elect governments. And I, I certainly think there should be a huge limit on, on what a human being can be worth. So, uh, yeah, there are a lot of good people, but I think they're trapped as long as we remain trapped within the current economic system, which is absolutely flawed. The two major things that I think are its flaws are, one, we seem to equate growth with progress, and economists actually think the economy can grow forever. It's impossible. So the idea of, of growth, a growth economy, that's got to stop. And the other thing is, that when I fight forest companies about their clear-cut logging of forests, they're talking about board feet, cubic meters of pulp, uh, jobs, profit, and I'm arguing about the ecological benefit of a standing forest. You know, it's doing all of these things, like taking carbon from the atmosphere, putting oxygen back in. Not a bad service for an animal like us, but guess what? Those don't cut any ice economically. So we're not arguing the same thing. And I think economics, every time we go in and talk about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we've always got to talk about it in, within an economic context. They're doomed to fail.
cannot work. My name is Heinrich Hora. I'm here from Sissi University. I don't know. Oh. Now, yeah. thank you very much for this overview. What problems, the system imminent problems we have all with our whole society, everything. I'm asking about possibilities, how little steps may come through to do more. I think, uh, you know, I, I think people have to get on with reducing our, our footprint for sure. And there's a lot of stuff, especially at the level of cities, a lot of very good stuff that's, that's going on. But I don't think that globally as a species, we're going to do it until we get out of the economic paradigm that we find ourselves arguing in. Lots of stuff locally. I'm very excited by the transition town movement. I think that uh, uh, you look at urban agriculture that's being driven in Canada, at least by young people. Uh, people are beginning to question uh, their values. Quite frankly, I think that to avoid the absolute catastrophe, we need uh, a market meltdown. We've got to have a collapse. I thought 2008 was going to be it. It wasn't hard enough, but until we get the stock market crashing to where people say, my God, this is a really screwed up system. We've got to change the whole thing. Uh, we're going to have to do it all in, in local groups. And that's where the action is. David, the uh, IPCC report is imminent. It's been five years since the last one. Um, there's been lots of leaks about what the content's likely to be. I fear that it's going to be portrayed as very divisive and that it will, the people will see this as scientists not united. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of great work in there from the many scientists, as you've talked about. How can we ensure that the focus remains on the great work of these scientists and continues to look at what we need in terms of foresight? Well, I think the, I mean, that's a very good question. I think that the whole discussion has been muddied you know, I, I want to remind you, in 1988, we were at the absolute height around the world of concern about the environment. In 1988, I came to Australia for the first time. I met Roz Kelly, who is the Minister of the Environment. She got it. She was right there. Uh, in 1988, a guy ran for President of the United States and said, if you vote for me, I will be an environmental president. You know, you know who that was? George H.W. Bush. He didn't have a green bone in his body, but he said it because Americans had put the environment at the top of the agenda. 1988, Brian Mulroney was re-elected Prime Minister in Canada. He appointed his brightest star to be the Minister of the Environment. I interviewed him three months after he was appointed. I said, Mr. Bouchard, what is the most critical issue Canadians face? And right away he said, global warming. I was impressed. I said, how serious is it? He said, it threatens the survival of our species. We have to act now. So it was all there in 1988. What the hell happened? Well, I'll tell you what happened. The fossil fuel industry and outrageously rich people like Gina Reinhardt and, uh, uh, and the Koch brothers in the United States began to pour, not millions, not tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars into a campaign of confusion supporting right-wing think tanks to say this is junk science, that this is a natural phenomenon, this, that humans can't possibly have that effect. Uh, and it worked. And we in the media have been complicit. When we have a story on climate change, we bring on a scientist like Tim Flannery who says, look, we've got to do this. And then, oh, well, we've got to have a balanced report, so we better get one of those skeptics to come on and say it's bullshit. And that's supposed to be balanced. We take an, a totally skewed uh, uh, picture of reality. Reality is the vast bulk of scientists are saying, this is serious, we got to do something. And a few people, mostly paid hacks by the fossil fuel industry, are saying otherwise. What's going to happen with the IPCC report? You can see it happening now. Institutions like the Heartland Institute, these right-wing think tanks, are going to pull pieces out here and there, out of context. They're going to lie. They're going to distort and say, see, it proves exactly what we said. It's not really happening. For the last 16 years, there's been no increase. So it's over. We're not going into gl global warming. And look, they've modified what they think the rise in temperature is. This is all baloney. And it will work. For the public, it's total confusion. What I fear is the public will get uh, uh, dis, 
a declining faith in scientists. This is really an attempt to set science aside as relevant. Oh, they're just another vested interest group. They just lie, you know, about climate gate and all that stuff. They just lie like everybody else. They want bigger grants, they want promotions. Uh, you know, they're, not, they're just like everyone else. And I fear that the waters are very, very muddied. And we have a total inability of the public to wade through all this information that's coming at them now to decide what is credible and what is not. For me, I tell people, well, who should I believe? I say, follow the money. Where are they getting their money? And that will indicate uh, what angle they're coming from. Dr. Suzuki, thank you very much for your time today in talking to us. Where are you? Oh, yeah. Up here, sir. Uh. <laughs> Given that you've talked about 150,000 years of us being animals on the planet, that actually seems rather small when you consider the Earth has been running, has life on the planet for billions of years. And what you've presented today is a very human-centric, almost selfish point of view that we need to sustain our own selves as a species. My question to you is though, and all of that is important, and I don't disagree with anything, anything that you have said in terms of our uh, damage to the, to the uh, environment of the Earth, but have we damaged the Earth significantly such that even if we did disappear as a species, that the cycle could not continue and the snakes, the birds or the lizards would take over from where we left off should we disappear in the fullness of time? Yeah, well, uh, you know, a lot of kids come up to me and say, how do I go about saving the planet? And I tell them, don't worry about the planet. The planet was fine long before we ever arrived, and it'll do fine long after we've, we've gone. Uh, so uh, life, I am sure, however catastrophically we've upset the balance, life will ultimately equilibrate, be a totally different kind of life. But I have children and I have grandchildren. I simply cannot uh, accept what many of my colleagues have uh, reached now, which is the, 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 the position that it's too late. You know, we, we've passed too many tipping points. I mean, I think this is what Clive Hamilton was suggesting in Requiem for a Species, uh, that it was too late. Uh, Sir Martin Rees, the uh, royal astronomer in England, was asked recently on BBC, what are the chances our species will survive to the end of the century, and he said 50-50. Uh, James Lovelock, who coined the expression Gaia for all life on Earth, has written a book in which he says over 90% of all humanity will be gone by the end of the century. Well, I, 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 I can't abide by uh, simply saying, oh, well, that's it. We've just got to live out our life. It's uh, too late. I have children and grandchildren, and I am not a Pollyanna-ish optimist but I live on hope. And the hope is based on the fact, and I told Clive this, we don't know enough to say it's too late. You know, we just barely know that much. And I believe that nature, if we give nature a chance, will be far more forgiving than we deserve. David. Can I ask you, uh, in that vein, you told a story to some teachers we had here, some science teachers, about the sockeye salmon. Ah. And I think that's worth repeating because it really makes the point well, of how little we know. Okay, well, uh, yeah, this is just a, a story that reinforces to me the fact of how little we know. The, there are five species of salmon in Canada and the most prized species commercially is called the sockeye salmon. It's got the bright red flesh, it's very fatty, and it, it's a wonderful fish. The largest run of sockeye salmon in the world is in the Fraser River in British Columbia. Before contact with Europeans, the uh, runs were about 100 to 120 million species, uh, a million animals a year. I mean, that's a lot of salmon fed the First Nations people up and down the Fraser system. Europeans came, they thought they were smart, they built a railroad along the shore, they caused a big landslide, plugged up the river, and they lost a, lo a lot of salmon. Anyway, it bounced back after years, and a 30 to 35 million run was considered a good run. Three years ago, we got just over one million sockeye running up the Fraser. And I said to my wife, that's it, that's just not enough biomass to get those animals up to the spawning grounds. Uh, we can forget about sockeye. A year later, we got the biggest run of sockeye in 100 years. 
Now, I like to tell this story not to show how stupid I am. <laughs> Nobody knows what the hell went on. We've got a royal commission trying to figure out what's going on. <laughs> we don't know, but what it showed was nature shocked us. And I believe that nature has many more surprises up her sleeve. Just give her a chance to recover. And uh, that's what gives me hope. Thank you, Suzuki. Uh, philanthropists who were mentioned earlier, uh, including Bill Gates, he's uh, supporting the experiment of geoengineering in what some claim is an insane effort to countermand global warming by dimming the sunlight that comes to the planet. In this university, if we are going to experiment on a single human being, we need their consent. Do you think there's some grounds here that the people should request that they be consulted first before such an experiment is done? Geoengineering is the ultimate expression of human arrogance and stupidity. <laughs> we don't know enough. We don't know enough, for God's sakes. How the hell do we think we're going to take over the atmosphere and manage the atmosphere? We know what the solution to the, to the climate crisis is. Get the hell off fossil fuels and get onto renewables. That's the answer. Thank you. Right? But this is, a, this is a very, very important point that you're making. We haven't learned a damn thing from our use of DDT, from CFCs, from nuclear, that we don't know about the unintended consequences because we don't know enough to try to apply our technologies and, and try to manage the earth. And we have the conceit to say, oh my god, we've created the problem. No, we're not going to stop. We're not going to stop re using uh, greenhouse gas or releasing greenhouse gas. We can't do that. Destroy the economy. So we'll bloody well engineer the planet. This is the stupidest bloody thing I can imagine. <laughs> Are there no women here. that are going to yes. be allowed to we ask have a woman. Hello. Thank, oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Yolanda Vega. On behalf of Mother Earth, I would like to thank you for continuing fighting for Mother Earth. My question is really basic. Considering everything that we've heard here today, considering we are still ignorant of our own planet and that we're not listening and the world is becoming far more conservative and far more right-wing every day, when do you think Mother Earth is just going to say, you know what, enough is enough, I'm going to spit you all out of my system and allow the next animal to come along? Well, I think we've already heard those messages, and this is what astounds me. Someone asked me that on radio. I, I was interviewed for, from Canada by an Australian radio uh, host, and he said, when are we going to, to pay attention to what's happening? And I said, why are you asking me? Mother Earth has given you the signals in Australia loud and clear. Wasn't there a, a prolonged drought in Australia? Aren't there super fires going on? Hasn't the barrier reef, 50% of it, been lost? What the hell? Australians ought to be at the, the ramparts telling us that it's here. You, I don't know if, if he can't. Mother Earth is telling us. I think we're being cut off. I'm just getting started. <laughs> Boy, did I put you between you a rock and a hard place quick. now. I think, I think we, we have had a feast of uh, intellectual ideas that uh, have really set a new bar for the Jack Beale lectures. Um, I think it's been, been a wonderful event. I'm conscious that uh, we can prevail on a person to a point where we exhaust them. Um, <laughs> our guest is, uh, as he said to me, is, is a, of amazing stamina, but is also time adjusting. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I would like to uh, ask you to join with me again in thanking him for what has been a really wonderful, a wonderful exposition and a wonderful evening of dialogue.